What if your DNA held the story of a war the world forgot, one that nearly erased half of humanity? Science suggests it wasn't just myth. Or legend. Our genes carry the scars of a global massacre from thousands of years ago. Each of us carries roughly 3.16 billion base pairs of DNA, which encode not only our genetic blueprint, but also the deepest biological truths of our species. Among them lies evidence of a violent past, so brutal, so extensive, that it may represent the first truly global conflict in human history. This revelation didn't come from ancient texts or ruined cities. It came from genome sequencing. Researchers studying modern human DNA found a startling genetic bottleneck, an event marked by a sharp decline in population and genetic diversity. Such bottlenecks are not unusual in evolution. One catastrophic example occurred 900,000 years ago, caused by natural disasters. But this recent bottleneck? It happened during the late Neolithic period and appears to have been our doing. Specifically, scientists examined the Y chromosome passed from father to son and found a staggering collapse in diversity. Oddly, this drop wasn't mirrored in mitochondrial DNA, which is inherited through the maternal line. In other words, something happened that wiped out a vast number of men, while largely sparing women. Had a volcano erupted? Had climate turned catastrophic? If so, both sexes would have been affected equally. But this wasn't a natural event. It was selective, targeted, violent. Decimated isn't strong enough. Scientists estimate that up to 95% of men across Africa, Europe, Asia, and the Middle East were eliminated during this period. That's the equivalent of 1 in 20 surviving. Some regions may have seen women outnumbering men 17 to 1. By percentage, no recorded war in history comes close. Repeating that scale today would mean losing nearly 4 billion men, leaving just 200 million behind. When DNA points to such a cataclysm, you'd expect to find bodies. And there are bodies. Countless ones. Over 250 known late Neolithic sites in Europe alone show signs of violent death. And Neolithic skeletons often bear unmatched levels of physical trauma, far more than seen in either earlier or later human remains. In one study of 2,300 early farmers, more than 10% showed weapon-inflicted injuries, likely from raids targeting crops and livestock. In Spain, Another analysis of 338 individuals revealed that 23% bore signs of violence, most of them men and teenage boys. Unhealed wounds and healed trauma suggested not just occasional violence, but recurring, even lifelong exposure to conflict. Still, bone injuries only tell part of the story. Sharp weapon fatalities leave marks only 15% of the time. Deaths from infection, starvation, or psychological trauma don't leave evidence on bone. And yet, even accounting for that, the frequency and brutality of Neolithic violence is staggering. Two forms of bloodshed became common, organized battles and indiscriminate massacres. One notorious site is the Talheim Death Pit in Germany, dated to around 5000 BC. There, at least 34 people were slaughtered. Many struck down while fleeing. Nearly all suffered cranial injuries, some layered atop other fatal blows. Among the dead were 16 children, 9 adult men, and 7 elderly women. But notably absent were younger adult women, suggesting they were captured as spoils of war. Talheim was a fortified settlement, with palisades meant to keep attackers out. That such defenses were needed at all speaks volumes. Another massacre occurred in Schletz, Austria, around the same time. Here, 200 victims were discovered, carelessly buried in a mass grave. Again, men died in droves. Again, adult women were missing. But this attack added a gruesome twist. Many bodies were found missing limbs or skulls. Some may have been tortured or dismembered. 
others, especially children and teens, were possibly abducted alongside the women. Different groups had different rituals. In Asia, headhunting was a known practice. But Europe had Herxheim. Herxheim, Germany. Between 5,300 and 4,950 BC, this 15-acre Neolithic village became the site of what may be the most gruesome prehistoric atrocity ever uncovered. But Herxheim wasn't attacked. It was the aggressor. Archaeologists discovered at least 80 pits surrounding the settlement. Inside the remains of over 1,000 individuals, possibly as many as 1,500, were found. They came from all walks of life. Infants, elders, farmers, hunter-gatherers, highlanders, and lowlanders. Some had traveled over 300 miles before meeting their end here. Scaled for today's population, it would be like a town building a mass grave containing over 800,000 corpses. Each body was methodically processed. Bones were broken. Skulls were cleaved in half and stripped of flesh. Tongues were likely removed. Brains, rich in fat, were possibly consumed. Limb bones were crushed for marrow. Some bodies were even spit-roasted. Once finished, remains were turned into utensils, decorations, and ceremonial objects. Skulls adorned the settlement entrance, grim trophies of a community seemingly obsessed with death. Researchers believe Herxheim's inhabitants may have practiced ritualistic cannibalism. They were likely skull cultists, revering human heads and consuming flesh as part of spiritual ceremonies. But it wasn't just spiritual fervor. Herxheim had logistics. Its population was tiny, fewer than 50 individuals. Yet it managed sustained, far-reaching raids that required organization planning, and brutal efficiency. And then, Herxheim vanished. No one knows what happened. Some believe the settlement was abandoned within 50 years, possibly wiped out in retaliation. Was it the worst? Perhaps. But Herxheim was not alone. Across the Neolithic world, evidence of barbarity piles up. Groups that collected skulls? Confirmed. Warriors who shattered enemy shins? Documented. Xenophobic tribes who hunted and mutilated outsiders? They existed. And yes, even cases of live burials have been found. Weapons were equally diverse. Adzes, axes, clubs, spears, bows, arrows, knives, scrapers, sickles, hoes, hammers, you name it. But while weapons advanced, protection did not. There were no helmets or body armor. Combatants wore basic cloth, leather, or plant fiber. The kill-to-survival ratio was grim. Simply reaching adulthood was a feat. Life expectancy ranged from 20 to 33 years, making the late Neolithic one of the most lethal eras in modern human history. Even excluding infant mortality, if you made it to 15, you likely wouldn't survive past 33. All of this begs a simple question. What went wrong? Why did so many cultures descend into near constant violence? One hypothesis blames success itself. The Neolithic Revolution, the transition from hunter-gatherers to agricultural societies, enabled permanent settlements, food surpluses, and explosive population growth. But it also introduced new reasons to kill. Territory, food stores, captives, settlements became loot chests, women, grain, livestock, all in one location. And proximity breed a paranoia. Neighbors became threats. Another theory focuses on social structure. As Neolithic societies grew, many organized into patrilineal clans, groups bonded by male lineage. These groups often excluded outside males. Women could move freely between clans, men could not. This made the Y chromosome highly vulnerable to war. When clans fought, they didn't just kill. 
They eliminated rival bloodlines, erasing Y-DNA in the process. Not everyone agrees. Some researchers suggest a more peaceful explanation. Lineal fission. As clans grew, they split into smaller groups. If a new clan was composed of closely related males, their Y-DNA could vanish over generations due to environmental strain or low reproductive success. Add natural selection, and male lineages might simply fade. More likely, both theories hold truth. Peaceful migration and ruthless warfare likely coexisted, together causing the one-sided genetic bottleneck, regardless of the cause. The effects of this ancient bottleneck remain imprinted in our DNA. Even today, some populations still haven't regained the Y chromosome diversity lost during that era. Had the bottleneck never occurred, the genetic landscape of humanity would look very different. Thankfully, humanity has recovered and evolved. Today, we don't kill on sight. Our genetic diversity has largely rebounded. Lifespans have more than tripled. But this raises one final question. How did the violence stop? The truth is, it didn't. Not at first. Over time, warfare grew deadlier in absolute terms, especially with the rise of metallurgy and organized armies. But so did our capacity to reproduce and repopulate. Eventually, the growth outpaced the death. Later, as societies became more complex and trade diplomacy and shared interests emerged, large-scale violence began to decline. Still, it wasn't until the last century that a measurable, consistent drop in conflict truly began. If you examine the last 600 years, you'll see the turning point. Since the end of World War II, the number of wars started annually has declined. Despite how things may feel today, we live in one of the most peaceful periods in human history, and it's reflected in our bodies. Our lifespans now stretch past 80 years, compared to the Neolithic ceiling of 33. The skull cults are gone. The mass graves have stopped growing. The bones are finally at rest. Thanks for watching, and until next time.